join together in a word of prayer. Lord, we come before you today carrying all the burdens and challenges of our life, the struggles that we face, the challenges that we see in other people's lives around us that we care about. We come to you today and we lay them at your feet and ask for your guidance and your direction as we consider this story of great tragedy and loss in your presence in the midst of those realities. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I'm very thankful that I still have all of my teeth at the age of 38. Does that seem like an odd statement? Fair enough. But I feel very blessed that in all of my years I have not had much difficulty. I've had a few cavities filled and a uh, root canal done, but overall I have pretty good dental health. That's not true of everyone. When I was about 10 years old, my dad was at about 40, he went through a time of a lot of pain and difficulty with his teeth. Now, admittedly, he had not done a good job throughout his life caring for his teeth. He did not have good dental hygiene practices. But he reached a time in his life in which his teeth were literally falling apart. He didn't have any of them left. It looked very bad, and he needed to do something about it. And so I remember that time in his life, he was about 40, when he actually had the rest of his teeth removed and received um, some false teeth to wear instead. Now, I was about Elam's age when this happened, and I, I was very aware of the fact that my dad was in a lot of pain. And I loved my dad, and so I wanted to be supportive and to try and to offer him some comfort. And so I said what I thought was the right thing to say in a situation where someone is in pain and in comfort, and needs some comfort. I said, I know how you feel. <laughs> yeah, he didn't laugh. In fact, he had more of a, an anger in his eyes and said with a bit of a cutting uh, tone to his voice, no you don't, and walked away. I was startled by that, perhaps a bit hurt as well, but it caused me to pause and to think about what I had really said. I really didn't know how he felt. I had no idea how he felt. The only teeth that I had lost were baby teeth that were supposed to come out. I hadn't lost any adult teeth. I hadn't had a lot of pain in my teeth or had any near, anywhere near the difficulty he had. I still haven't had anywhere near that type of pain and discomfort as what he experienced. And I wonder if perhaps for many of us, this is a similar reality when we come to the book of Job. Certainly, many, if not all of us, have experienced loss or trouble or tragedy of one type or another. And some of us certainly have experienced very deep and painful tragedy, pain that we still carry with us to this day in the midst of our daily lives. But I'm not sure that any of us have experienced nearly the barrage of tragedy, one after another, to the point of what we read Job experiencing in today's passage. We'll come back to that in a moment. First, I want us to step back and look a little bit at the background here for the book of Job. Those of us who are reading through the Bible chronologically have just wrapped up Genesis, and now we come to the book of Job. Exodus comes after Genesis, right? Canonically. But when we're looking at it chronologically, we don't know for sure when the events of Job happened, but the assumption is that they happened more about the time of the patriarchs, the main characters in Genesis, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. Because like Abraham, Job's wealth is primarily based on livestock and servants. And like Abraham, he, as the head of the family, goes and offers sacrifices on behalf of others. He doesn't have a priest who is an intercessor between. And like those who had lived 187 years, 170 years, 145 years, 147 years, Job lived 140 years. He lived a long life. And so it's assumed that while the book may have been put in its final form later, the events of it probably took place near or after the days of Genesis. And so we come to this prologue, we come to this introduction, in which in the land of Uz there was this man named Job. Now we don't know for sure where this land was. We know that it wasn't in Israel, and it very likely may have been near or another name for the land of Eden, 
the Edom. Job was a man who was blameless, upright. He feared God and he shunned evil. Now from our Christian vantage point, that may seem a little bit difficult to believe that he was really blameless. After all, we know that all have fallen short of the glory of God. All have sinned. And yet here's his claim that Job was blameless. But perhaps, instead of this being a statement of moral absolute, that he really did not do absolutely anything wrong, it's more of a declaration of his level of innocence. Everyone knew that Job was a good person. Everyone knew that he didn't deserve to undergo the tragedies and the experiences that he was undergoing. The narrator declares his blameless state. Job defends it throughout the book. Even God, on two occasions, declares that Job is blameless and upright. This is the state of who he was as he experiences these difficulties. And we can see this as well in the fact that he was so wealthy, right? That's what the narrator is setting the stage for. Job had seven sons and three daughters. He had 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels, 500 yoke of oxen and 500 donkeys, and a multitude of servants. Job had been blessed. The people knew that Job was a good person. But things take a pretty dramatic turn, don't they? One day the angels come and they present themselves before God, and along with them, Satan comes. And God asks him, where have you come from? And he says, from roaming the earth, going back and forth on it. And then God says to him, have you considered my servant Job? He's blameless and upright. He fears God, and he shuns evil. And Satan replies, well, of course, why wouldn't he? Haven't you put your hedge of protection around him and all that he owns? Stretch out your hand now and take away what he has, and he will turn to you and curse you to your face. Now think about that. Can you imagine the gall to be able to say that? To go before the Lord and to say that? And God says to him, all right then. You may, all that, I, all that he has is in your possession now, but you may not lay finger upon him. And Satan goes and tragedy strikes. Now imagine for a moment that you are Job. Everything is right with the world. You have a beautiful family, many descendants. You have livestock. You have servants. When out of nowhere one of your servants comes running up to you in a panic, declaring that your oxen that were out in the field and the donkeys that were nearby had been taken by the Sabians and all the servants except for me were killed. And while you're still trying to catch your breath from these, this news, another servant runs up and tells you that fire came down out of the sky and took all of your sheep away, and all the servants except for me, and I am the only one who escaped to come and tell you. And while your head is still spinning from all of that, another servant comes and says that the Chaldeans came down and raided your camels, and now they're all gone. They killed all your servants. I'm the only one who survived. And if that wasn't bad enough, a final servant comes rushing over and informs Job that all of his sons and his daughters were celebrating together when a wind came out of the desert, knocked down the four corners of the house, and everyone died except for me. And I have come to tell you what has happened. Imagine receiving that barrage of bad news. Your world has utterly and literally be flipped upside down in a matter of moments. How would you respond to those circumstances? You 
we read how Job responds. <laughs> he tears his clothes, he pours ashes on his head, and he collapses in worship of God. He responds to all of this calamity with worship. He declares, naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked I'll depart from this world. The Lord gives, the Lord takes away. Praise be the name of the Lord. And in all of that, he did not sin. But it's not over yet, is it? Job has lost all of his livestock, practically all of his servants, all of his children. And yet we read that another day comes when the angels come and present themselves before the Lord. And once again, Satan comes. And once again, God asks him where he's come from. And once again, he says, from roaming the earth, going back and forth. Well, have you considered my servant Job? He's blameless and upright. He fears God and he shuns evil. And even after you incited me to turn against him, he still maintains his integrity. And Satan replies, skin for skin. A man will do anything to save his life. If you turn on him now and stretch out your hand against him and inflict his bones and flesh, he will turn to you and curse you to your face. And once again, God grants the permission for him to go to Job and to cause him harm. But he did not take his life. And so we read that Job experienced sores from the soles of his feet to the crown of his head. And as he sat in the ashes, he took a piece of pottery and scraped his skin with it. And in the midst of this pain and suffering, his wife says to him, Do you still defend yourself? Your reputation? Curse God and die. Nothing like a supporter. Stops, right? <laughs> and it's the pain of suffering to have that kind of support and love and nurture in this that, right? But Job says, no, you're speaking foolishly. Should we only accept the good from God and not accept God's presence in the midst of the trouble as well? And then we read that Job's friends come. Finally, some support, right? from Eliphaz and Bildad and Zophar. They come from different places, deciding together they are going to come. They've heard what's happened to Job. They want to support him. And when they see him, they're overwhelmed by how bad he looks. They themselves rip their clothes and pour ashes on their heads. And they sit in silence with Job for seven days and seven nights. The ministry of presence, of being present in the midst of tragedy, of loss, of pain, and of sorrow. But it goes downhill from there. Finally, Job speaks, and he shares of his pain and his suffering. He defends his, his reputation, and he calls on God to hear his defense. But in the midst of that, his friends respond to these circumstances. And what we have then is this poetic back and forth between friend and Job talking about the doctrine of retribution. That's just a fancy way of saying good things happen to good people, bad things happen to bad people. That's just the way it is. Because that's what the narrator has set up, right? Job was blameless. He was upright. And he had all of these blessings. And so the reverse of that must also be true. If someone is experiencing difficulties and tragedy, there must be sin in their life that's bringing that about because that's just the way the world works. And isn't that at some level within most of us what we expect out of life? I, I know it is for my children. Oftentimes something will happen to us, but that's not fair. I don't deserve that. That shouldn't happen to me. I know it's true of me as well when things happen. I want to say, but what did I do? I didn't do anything. What did I do? We have this sense of that's the way the world should work. When we are good, we are blessed. When we are bad, we are punished. 
And yet in this dialogue, we hear this challenge from the experience of Job. Because his experience doesn't match up with that doctrine of retribution. He knows that he has been blameless and good. That he does not deserve to experience these tragedies. And yet he has. And what is he to do with it? But his friends choose not to believe Job's experience. To stand beside him. Instead, they choose to believe in this doctrine of retribution. And so they spend this time debating with him. Eliphaz goes first. In essence, he's saying, well, you have had a good life. Things have gone well overall. Everyone's going to experience a little something, but it's not going to last. It's going to be a short little thing you're going to go through, a blip on the radar, and then things will get better. But Job is unwilling to accept the fact, to accept the implication that he has done anything wrong. Next, Bildad steps up to the plate and he says, well, it's not as bad as it could be. All your kids are dead. They must have done something much worse than you. You're still alive. Once again, you did something wrong. It's just not as bad as what they did. So you should be thankful that this is all you're experiencing. You're still alive. And once again, Job, Job stands by his reputation. He stands by his way of living a blameless life and defends himself. And then Zophar speaks up. And Zophar says, if you're experiencing all this tragedy, what's really going on here is that you've been putting on a front for us. You've pretended like you're blameless, like there's nothing going on, when in reality, there must be a whole lot of stuff going on because all this is happening. In order for this to happen, you must have been doing something really bad. But again, Job defends himself. He challenges this idea that the world is a one-to-one -one thing in which good leads to blessing, bad leads to tragedy. Nowadays, we sometimes call this or refer to it as the health and wealth gospel, that as long as we do what's right, God will bless us, give us more, and our lives will be very fruitful. So what are we to take from all of this? What lessons does this offer us as we experience and see Job encountering such tragedy when, in reality, it doesn't affirm this idea of the doctrine of retribution, the way we think the world should work? I'm sure there's much we can take from it. One of the things that stood out to me is the reality that in the midst of all of this, all of these circumstances that happen, God remains in control. God remains in control. In the midst of everything that goes on in our world, the good, the bad, everything, God is the one who is in control. The second part of that is that it's Satan who desires ill for us. It's not God. God wants the best for us. And knowing that intention matters. Knowing that God desires the best for us makes a difference. And clearly the prologue to the story tells us that it's not God who wants ill for Job, it's Satan who wants ill. Thirdly, we see that in the midst of these circumstances that are happening to Job, in the midst of these things that come across against him, that we have this model of how we can respond to our circumstances. Job underwent so much pain and suffering and tragedy. And yet he chose to respond with worship. To worship God even in the midst of the pain and the tragedy and the loss. And later on, we see another model that as he moves beyond his worship and gets into this dialogue with his friends, he brings his pain and his suffering before God. 
Now he struggles not feeling like God is hearing him, not experiencing God's support through this. That's what he feels. But we see that he brings this before God, that he offers it up to him, that he desires to work this out with God. He doesn't turn his back on God. He comes before God with all that he's experienced, with all of his suffering, and seeks to work it out with him. Seeks to have understanding of what it is that God is really doing. Here. And in the midst of all of this, we see that God had incredible trust and belief in Job's ability to go through this. We never see anywhere that God questioned whether or not Job could handle this. As Satan taunted God and called him out and tried to have God work against Job, God did not, but he remained confident and supportive of Job, even in the midst of these realities, knowing who he was and his faith in God. Where do we go from here? We have a few more chapters to read. We'll return next week to see what good may come out of these troubles and tragedies that Job has experienced.